free. Hebrews chapter 3. We'll begin reading verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all of his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The Bible tells us as Christians that God wants us to have competence. He wants us to have competence in Him. He wants us to have competence in His message. He wants us to have competence in our <coughs> ultimate goal of heaven. He wants us to have competence in knowing that we can live in eternity with Him. And we see that God has given us this call to competence and He has given us the reasons for which we should be competent. He has given us the means necessary for us to be competent. And He has given us examples of individuals who have showed their competence. And He wants us to act as individuals like those individuals uh, that we read about who are examples. He wants us to act as if we are competent. He wants us to put our competence into action. We know here in verse 6 that Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the competence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We have a conditional statement here. And this conditional statement exists not only within the ability that we have to be competent, but also within the means that is necessary for us to be competent, and that is the provided word that God has given us. The means to where we can achieve competence. Competence comes from knowledge, and that knowledge comes from hearing and understanding. In verse 14 of chapter 3, the Hebrews writer says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our competence steadfast unto the end. He emphasizes in both verse 6 and in verse 14 that this is a competence that we need to have and, ex and exemplify from the very beginning of our Christian life to the very end. It's something that we ought to hold on to. It's something that we ought to uh, continue in. It's something that should be a part of who we are. The Hebrews writer begins chapter 3 by pointing out the faithfulness and the strength and competence that Moses had and the strength and the competence that the people of Israel, the, the Jewish nation, had in Moses. And they had that competence rightly so because Moses was chosen of God. But here the comparison made to one who is greater than Moses, one who is not just the overseer of the house, but the builder of the house. And so the comparison is, if you have competence in the one who oversees the house, you ought also to have competence in the one who built the house. How much greater is the individual who, who built, who purchased, who who, uh, who made plans for the house. And then in verse 6 he says, A son over his own house, whose house are we? These individuals, uh, the Hebrews that were being written to, had come out of Judaism and into Christianity. Uh, 
and the Hebrews writer primarily trying to write to these uh, Hebrew Christians to encourage them to remain faithful and not to be uh, caught back up into Judaism or to go back into a, a, a system of faith that did not exist anymore. And he does so by pointing to the confidence in the faith of Moses and pointing to the greater confidence that we can have in the Christ. And so this confidence is not one that is based upon anything that we did or based upon anything that we have come across that of an earthly nature. This confidence has been given to us through centuries of historical fact and historical evidence, right? And of the, to the Hebrews anyway, recent events that took place proving that Jesus was the fulfillment of the very prophet that Moses prophesied of who would come after him. And so, not just these Hebrews, but all first century Christians and all Christians who would follow should have that same competence. And it should be a competence that we hold on to the very end. We ought not to be a people who worry and have doubt when it comes to uh, salvation, when it comes to what God wants in our lives, when it comes to uh, being right with God. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to question. We don't have to be worried because God has given us the means and the provisions to have the confidence necessary that we hold on to the end. So what is the source of our confidence? It's very simply put, isn't it? It's very easy to see that we have a full assurance based upon what God has presented us in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through verse 23, having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. We have a faithful high priest, we have a faithful uh, Savior who offered his blood, and uh, took that blood to uh, the heavenly Father beyond the heavenly veil and offered that blood as a sin sacrifice for all of the people. And with that, with that action, we have the ability to hold fast the profession of our faith. It's a faith that's based upon action. It's a faith that's based upon the evidence and the facts that have been presented. And so we can have full assurance of that faith. It's not a faith that's based upon hearsay. It's not a faith that's based upon uh, uh, mysticism or, uh, or, or anything that's, uh, that can't be proven. There are eyewitness accounts. There are individuals uh, who were skeptics who were eyewitness accounts. There were individuals who were actually enemies of the Christians in the first century who were eyewitness accounts. And so we can have full assurance of faith. And faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. If we can have a full assurance of faith. Because we know the things that our faith is built upon. And that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Then that same word of God can lead us to be confident. To the very end. About the salvation that we can have in the Christ. Full confidence comes from completely trusting in God. When we fail to think about God, when we fail to think about God's promises, when we leave God out of our own plan making, that's when worry and doubt uh, can creep into our minds. We ought not to have worry and doubt as it pertains to salvation as long as we seek answers from God. It's not a blind leap in the faith, it's not a quiet trust. It's simply willing to confess 
that there are expectations based upon promises that God has given us. Paul told the church at Rome that if things were done uh, in a manner that were, that were doubting or were not in competence or full assurance of faith, that that was sin. In Romans 14 verse 23, he says, He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Even if that thing was not wrong, or even if that thing was right to participate in, if an individual participates in it not knowing, he's acting upon a thing without fact and evidence. God wants us not to act blindly and hope it's right. He wants us to know it's right and do it's right. Right? And so if we do it and we know uh, why we're doing it, that's, that's competence. God wants us to know why we do things. That's why He's given us His Word. He's explained why we do it. Why do we hear the Word of God? Why must we assemble together to hear the preaching of the Gospel? Because that's how faith comes. Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper on each first day of the week? Because we are to remember the Lord's death till He comes. Why do we give of our means on the first day of the week? Uh, to make sure that the work of the church can be taken care of here in this life. Why do we confess that Jesus is the Christ? Because there's salvation in no other name. Acts 4 verse 12. Why do we have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to have our sins remitted? Because there's no other place where we can get into Christ. Romans 6, 3, and 4. So God didn't just give us commands. He gave us the reasoning behind the commands. And if we uh, look into a further study, you can go all the way back to the Old Testament and see that things that were taught and prophesied, all of those things, generally speaking, lead up to the things that we know today. God was preparing us from the very beginning. He was and those of us living today have more evidence than anyone else who has ever lived. Right? Everything that Paul did after he became a Christian, we know that he did so in faith. He did so based upon the facts and the knowledge that he had that came from uh, either special knowledge or he himself reading. He understood the Scripture he also had inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He allowed those things to lead him to do what he, what he said, what he taught, where he went. And then when his life was to come to pass, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8, Paul could confidently say, I have fought a good fight. How could he say, I've fought a good fight? Well, he understood that the Christian life in God's eyes was seen as a fight. And that he himself was considered a soldier. And that's why in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and following, he explains that our life is like that of a Christian soldier who has to put on the armor of God to withstand the wiles of the devil. That's why Paul could say he fought a good fight, because he lived it. That's how he lived his life. He knew that God saw this Christian life as a spiritual battle, as a spiritual warfare, and that's why he told us. He said, I have finished my course. How could Paul say that he had finished his course? Because he knew that God had told him that the life of a Christian was like a race, that you begin and you don't stop until you finish. Right? Only, only those who finish the race receive the crown. So Paul could confidently say, I have finished the course because God had explained. And he, Paul, explained it to us by putting it down in writing. I have kept the faith. How could he say I've kept the faith? Because he understood what the faith was. And the faith here is not a reference to your personal beliefs. It's, a, it's, a, it's like Jude 3 uh, where the Bible tells us that the faith was once delivered to the saints. The faith here represents the whole uh, totality of the Christian system, the New Testament faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. That Word leads us to believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and be faithful unto the end, right? 
That system of faith is what led Paul to where he was on this day when he said, I have kept the faith. Now how could he say, I have kept the faith? He, he could say that because he knew God told me there were certain things to do. I did those things. I didn't change them one way or another. I didn't loosen them where I wanted to loosen them or I didn't bind where I wanted to bind. I kept it exactly as God gave it to me. And therefore he said, I kept the faith. He protected the faith. He defended the faith. When, when Paul was done with his life, the faith was exactly the way it was when God gave it to him. And so Paul was able at the end of his life to say these things. I've finished the course, I've kept the faith, and I've fought the good fight. And he could say it with confidence because he knew what was expected of him. He knew what was expected of him. That's important, isn't it? So, what was Paul's conclusion? It was a very confident conclusion, wasn't it? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Now some people would say, well, Paul's being very boastful here, saying, well, the Lord's going to give me a crown of life. How does He know? Right? Paul was not being presumptuous, was he? Paul was only making a conclusion based on what he had read in the Scriptures and what God had told him. And Paul, as an inspired apostle, tells us, I'm not the only one that's going to be happy on that day. Everyone else who loves His appearing, and who's going to love His appearing? The people who love the Christ's appearing or the second time are going to be the same people who loved His appearing the first time. The people who are thankful that Jesus came and shed His blood and uh, offered us a way to have our sins washed away and gave us that fight to fight. Gave us that course to to run, gave us the faith by which we could be saved. Those individuals who obey the Lord are going to be thankful when they see Jesus. <laughs> right? Now listen, I've never seen a second coming. Right? <laughs> right? Nobody's ever seen a second coming. Okay? Uh, I don't know what that's going to be like other than what the Bible tells us. Right? Paul tells us that it's going to uh, happen very quickly. It's going to be very noticeable. It's going to be loud. The, the Bible tells us it's going to uh, come with a shout, with the trump of God. Um, it's going to be very visual, that the Lord's going to descend in the clouds. Uh, the Bible tells us that the dead and the grave are going to rise. Those that have been faithful to the Lord are going to meet with those who are still alive and faithful uh, in the air. Well, it's possible that... Uh, there'll be a little anxiety even among those who are looking forward to that day, <laughs> right? I mean, because that's, uh, that's something nobody's ever seen before. Uh, but if a person knows that he has heard the gospel, believed it, and obeyed it, he knows what's next, right? He knows what's next. No more tears. No more pain. That's good stuff, isn't it? See, that's the reason somebody's going to love the second coming because he knows pain, tears, flesh, gone. It's over. Paul basically was saying, I've, you know, the second coming hasn't come, but I've, I've reached my end. And I'm ready because I know what God told me to do and I did it. Now, Paul was not a perfect person. He was not sinlessly perfect, Right? But he took advantage of the opportunities he was given to ask for forgiveness and to turn away from things that he knew separated him from God. And ultimately, he never left God. He stayed faithful to God. And so just as Paul was confident in this life, so can we. And we can be confident not just in this life, but in the next. And that confidence comes from knowing what God says, following the examples of men like Paul who knew what God said and lived what God said and then apply that to our own lives. <clears throat> In Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, 
Colossians 2, 1 and 2, Paul says, I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Basically, when Paul wrote letters, when Paul visited these congregations in the first century, it was to make sure that these individuals were remaining steadfast to what they'd been taught, and two, confident in that, right? So we looked at the uh, one thing was they had a full assurance of competence based upon their full assurance of faith, which came from hearing the word of God. Then Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, he wanted them not just to have a full assurance of faith, but a full assurance of understanding. Understanding. You know, sometimes it's possible for people to know something and not understand it. And you might know a thing to be right or be true, but you may not be able to apply it. Or you might apply it wrong because you don't have full understanding. So the scripture gives us the ability not just to know a thing is right, but to understand why it's right. Right? It goes back to what I said just a moment ago. God doesn't just command us to do things without explaining why we do them and giving us the meaning behind them. I'm currently taking uh, some technology instruction. And um, I use a, a computer uh, basically for word processing and maybe some Excel sheets and internet, you know, just basic use. So a lot of this stuff is new to me, okay? And I have used PowerPoint uh, for presentations and things, so that has been helpful. but. You know, there's a lot more technology out there now that's even beyond that. I use my phone as a phone still, which most people, a lot of people use their phone for things other than a phone. So I still use a phone. I, I, if I don't have an app for that, whatever that is, I don't have an app for it. So when, when you talk about apps, I ain't got it, whatever it was. So, uh, so there are times in this technology class that there are words and phrases and things that go over my head. And uh, it makes me feel a little inferior, okay? Because I don't understand. <laughs> now, uh, I do what's necessary to make sure I understand. I stay after class. I spend time practicing on these things. I, I've, I've invested in it, and so I take the time to learn it, right? But when it's coming at me, it's, a, it's fast and furious, okay? And so I get this feeling of uneasiness and, uh, and I'm uncomfortable. Why? Because I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay, so uh, maybe I stay after class for an hour or so and I play around with it on the computer, right? The more I play around with it, the more I see this isn't as bad as it at first seemed, right? And then I do it another day and another day. And then you start realizing, okay, I can add to this and add to that. And the more you work with it, the more you practice with it, the more comfortable you, you become, right? Well, that's just the nature of anything we do, right? It, riding a bicycle, driving a car, whatever it is, when you first start to learn it, when you first start to get involved in it, it may seem to be a bit much because you're getting a lot of information very quickly and some of it you may not know or understand, and so you don't have the competence, right? Well, if you don't have the competence, you shouldn't use that competence until you're ready, right? But at the same time, we should be able to overcome that nervousness. And in my case, the only way to overcome that nervousness is to stay after class, to, to practice, to study, to learn, right, to ask questions to spend time in it. Well, that's the same thing with the Bible, isn't it? I mean, if I don't know the Bible, if I don't understand something in the Bible, I need to spend more time in it. I don't, I don't need to say, I don't understand it. It's overwhelming. I need to spend more time in it. And that's the whole point. 
we can't have full assurance of faith without hearing, and we can't have full assurance of understanding without in-depth study. We need to study. And that's what the Bible tells us. And that's why Paul was able to say at the end of his life that he had such confidence because he had that assurance of faith and that assurance of understanding. And as I said, God gives us the means to understand. It's just we may have to spend time in studying God's Word, right? Then we have to have full assurance of what God, that what God says is going to come to fruition. That God's promises are accurate, that God's promises are true, and that our obedience will result in what He says. The Apostle Peter said that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Right? The Lord is not slack, but is desirous that all men come to repentance. God cannot lie, the Bible tells us. In 1 John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, Verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Our relationship to Christ is based upon our knowing what God wants and us doing it. Do you know the Lord? Well, there are a lot of people who say they know the Lord. But do they really know the Lord? They don't know Him if they're not doing what He says to do because God commands us to do. So the Bible says, Hereby we do know that we know Him. That's confidence, right? We don't just know Him. We know we know Him. How if we keep His commandments? So if an individual says, I know Jesus or uh, I have, I've made Jesus my personal Savior and they don't do what He says, they don't have confidence because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they don't know. Verse 4, He that saith, I know and keepeth not His commandments is a liar. Now that's pretty rough, isn't it? Pretty rough. Well, this paper, that means it is possible for someone to say, I know Jesus, I have made Jesus my personal Savior, and that person be lying. Even though they believe they know Jesus. See, we're not saying, Jesus didn't say you're lying that you believe it. You might believe, you can believe anything you want to, right? That doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it true. You know, for a long period of time, people thought that the earth was flat. It is true that they believed that, but it wasn't true, right? Well, there are a lot of people who believe things, and it's true that they believe them. They even believe that they know Jesus, but the Bible says they're lying. Who are they lying to? They're lying to themselves. They're lying to themselves. They say they know God and do not what He says. And Jesus says here by inspiration to John, he, he who says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. But whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. There's no other way to have confidence that we're right with God except that we know what he says and we know that we're doing what he says. So if a person doesn't know what he says, you don't have confidence. And if you do know what he says and you're not doing what he says, then you can be confident that you're not in him. But you shouldn't be confident of any other thing. So obedience. We must have assurance of obedience. And that's what this is all talking about, isn't it? Doing what God says to do. And to the Hebrews, uh, you know, that's where we started our lesson. To the Hebrews, this was especially important. But it's also important to us today, isn't it? Because these Hebrews had uh, left Judaism, which was a law that was no longer in effect because Jesus nailed it to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. He enacted a new law that these individuals had obeyed and become Christians. But there were individuals who were trying to call them away from that hope. And so the inspired Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32... You can have a full assurance of faith. You can have a full understanding of faith. And you can have full obedience. And still lose it. And still lose it. 
Notice verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated or after you came to a knowledge of the truth. And that didn't take place miraculously, right? It took place by hearing the word of God. Ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Well, one of the afflictions was within themselves. They had to say, I once was, I once was a Jew, but according to the prophecies, this system is supposed to come to an end and I'm supposed to stop being a Jew and start being a Christian. Okay? That was an affliction that they had to start, to start with was they had, they had conflicting views within themselves. Then they had to, the affliction of knowing if I leave Judaism, there's going to be a lot of people who are angry with me. Right? Paul understood that because when he left uh, being a Jew or a Hebrew of Hebrews, people tried to kill him. So he said, but you already did that. You already endured these afflictions. And then in verse 33, he says, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So they did these things knowing that it was not for reward in this life, but for reward in the next. But notice verse 35. Remembering these things. Remember what you left. Remember what you went through. Right? Remember what you went through to get out of that lifestyle. Remember what you went through uh, to be faithful to the Lord. Verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. You know, you can throw your confidence away. You can have confidence and then throw it away. Which hath great recompense of reward. That's the only thing that has reward, right? Now, why would somebody throw away their confidence? Well, because in this day and age, the persecution was tough. And they were being persecuted and they were being encouraged to throw away that confidence and to go back into a lifestyle that offered nothing. But of course they were being offered the world. Right? Come back. It's funner over here. Look at what look at all the good enjoyment, entertainment you've given up. Right? And what are you getting out of it? Just heartache and pain and law keeping. Right? Come back over here. It's funner over here. There, there's more to do over here. Right? That's, that's the temptation to go back. And people do that. They cut and they throw away their confidence. They quit having confidence in what they know to be right. right. And it was based upon facts and evidence and conviction. But temptation can cause an individual to say, okay, I'm leaving and going back. And to some of us, that's very difficult to think, but we've seen it happen, haven't we? We've seen people who once were faithful to the Lord leave it. They cast it away. They threw it away. Now, how did they do that? Well, it's hard to, it's hard to believe, but it's possible. And what they chose to do was they chose to build up a confidence to that old life again. And they know somewhere deep in their minds that the reason they left that old life was because there was nothing there but destruction. But they chose for the pleasure of the old life to cast away the confidence of hope and eternal life and to put their confidence back in something that has no ground to stand. Basically for earthly pleasures, treasures, wanting to fulfill the lusts of now rather than to wait. So we have full assurance of faith. We have full understanding, full assurance of understanding. A full assurance and obedience which leads to God fulfilling His promises. But we have to make sure that we don't throw it all away. God has given us every reason to be confident. 
And the Bible tells us that there are going to be people who are upset at us for being confident. Um, they show their irritation towards us and saying things like, you're the only ones, you think you're the only ones going to heaven. Things of that nature. That are meant to derisively. They're not meant complimentary. And of course, we don't teach that God uh, wants to keep anybody out of heaven. Uh, we teach what God teaches, and that is God wants all men everywhere to be saved. That's what God wants, and that's what we want. Now, we're confident, based upon our full assurance of faith and full assurance of understanding and full assurance to obedience as it pertains to God's promises, that we can enjoy the hope of eternal life. And what we're saying is we want you to enjoy that too. We want you to enjoy that too. We're not trying to eliminate people from heaven. We're trying to increase the numbers who go to heaven. And so we seek not to have individuals irritated with us, but to encourage those individuals to have that same confidence. Right? We want, this, we want people to enjoy the same confidence that we have. So we invite those individuals to set aside their doubts and their fears and open up their minds and their eyes and their ears to what God has said and hear the gospel, believe it, repent of their past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, be immersed in water to have their past sins washed away, allow the Lord to add them to His church and be faithful to the very end having confidence in what God has told us and what God has promised us and enjoy that confidence. Be appreciative of that confidence and not cast it away or throw it away. Now, if there are those who have doubts and worries and are on the verge of throwing it away, don't do it. Come back home. Seek out God's full assurance of faith, right? Start over if you have to. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Go back. Full understanding. Go back. Study. If you have worries and doubts, go back to the Word of God where it all began and build up your faith again so that you can have confidence in Him. If you have a need this afternoon, we're here to assist as we stand and sing. Why?